Well, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. I know there's a lot of football going on today. No Georgia Tech football today, though. We, 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 uh, we did look at the calendar. Uh, it <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a real pleasure uh, to have and to introduce Dr. Wayne Clough here at TELUS, the former secretary of the Smithsonian, president emeritus of the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, before we get started, just making sure you know to get your phones on mute, please. And if you uh, want to take photographs, feel free to do so. Let's get the flashes turned off. It really annoys me. Uh, we're, we're here to, to, to talk about and celebrate the um, uh, publishing of uh, Dr. Clough's new book, Things New and Strange. And we've got to do things a little different than what we've done in, at other lectures. We're going to have a presentation about Dr. Clough. Then he and I are going to sit down and have a conversation uh, about the book, then some Q&A, and then uh, go back outside for, for book signing. Dr. Clough and Tells has had quite a relationship over the years. As president of Georgia Tech, he visited us while, it, while the museum was just starting uh, construction. Tells became a Smithsonian affiliate under his watch as uh, secretary of the Smithsonian. He spoke at one of our major exhibit openings. He wrote the foreword to my book, The 50 Coolest Things That Tell Us. He secretly brings his grandkids over here without telling me <laughs> <laughs> so he can enjoy the museum without, without uh, uh, as a civilian. And, and last but not least, he does not know this. He and I share the same birthday. Next Tuesday, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald Wayne Clough spent his childhood in Douglas a small town in South Georgia that plays a major role in his book. Went to high school in Chattanooga, earned his bachelor's and master's at Georgia Tech, and a PhD in civil engineering at Berkeley. Uh, he had quite an academic career with increasing responsibilities at Duke, Stanford, and Virginia Tech, where he became dean of the College of Engineering and the University of uh, Washington, where he became provost. In 1994, he became the first alumnus to become president of Georgia Tech, where, among many things, he doubled funding for research, he increased student enrollment by 50%, he led a $1 billion expansion on the Tech campus. And he got along really well with students. They called him Funk Master G. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Retiring after 14 years at Tech, in 2008, he then became the 12th secretary of the Smithsonian, where, among many things, he initiated the digitizing of the Smithsonian collection and expanding uh, programs for youth, which uh, TELUS has really been uh, a good participant uh, with that. So retiring finally from the Smithsonian in 2014, he and his wife Ann are, ba and are back in Georgia, splitting their time between a home in Atlanta and one in Big Canoe. Uh, spending time with their, uh, their son and daughter and their families. Dr. Clough has too many awards for me to mention. So at this point, I'd like to just quit while I'm ahead and uh, ask you to give a warm welcome to Dr. G. Wayne Clough. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. <laughs> Thank you, Jose, and happy birthday to you as well. Um, <laughs> The funk master story is always a Smithsonian connection, right? So when I'm secretary of the Smithsonian, I got to meet people who were making donations to the artifacts, to the collection. And uh, so my folks from American history and, and, and culture, pop, popular culture, said, we've got someone special for you to meet. It's a man named George Clinton. George Clinton is the funk master. <laughs> <laughs> he invented the whole thing. So I got to meet my match, if you will, at that time. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for coming out <clears throat> on a beautiful fall day, and it was a lovely day. We drove down from Big Canoe, and it was just as pretty as it could be. So I appreciate you taking time to be with me and, and with Jose and the museum. And again, thanks to the museum and Jose for all the great work they've done. Uh, it's something I really admire. I, I mentioned, but I'll say it again. As, as Secretary of the Smithsonian, we have over 200 affiliates, and I travel to see many of them. And this is truly one of the finest regional science museum in the country, without, without doubt. You can applaud those folks if you want. 
So the idea for this book, um, I grew up in Douglas, Georgia. Um, my parents were of modest means. They ran an ice and coal company there. Uh, and when I was 13 years old, their business model uh, was coming to an end and they had to leave. So I only lived in Douglas about 13 years. They left, but they always loved this town. And in their life, they'd had to move away twice, but they always moved back. But my roots go back deeper than that. My family from that time goes back five generations in South Georgia. So my great-great-grandfather came to South Georgia in 1837. So I have uh, deep roots in terms of my family there. There are many family members, I still have many family members, cousins, aunts, uncles, so forth, who still live in the area. And, and my parents came back when they retired. They passed away there, and they're buried in the Douglas City Cemetery. So it's a place that I have a, a fond admiration for. Um, so I wanted to do something as I got further along in my life to say thanks to that area and to write something about it. And I realized a lot of other people as I got to researching the subject had written other books about South Georgia and that area better than I could ever write and who had lived there longer. But at that time I was secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and I realized I had access to something nobody else had access to and that's the Smithsonian Collection which are amazing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. So I decided that what I would do was to start looking around the collections and see if I could find something about that area where I grew up, and then use that as a way to tell the story. And uh, that's sort of like uh, going, Alice going down the rabbit hole. Uh, it's very hard to get out of it. And it turned out that there were more things in the collections than I ever imagined never expected to see those things, and, and it turned out to be a journey that took six years uh, to complete. And so I want to share with you a little bit about that because it, it tells us a lot about ourselves uh, when you start looking at things in that way. Uh, first, I have to share with you sort of the boundaries of what I mean by South Georgia. When I first went to see a curator in the Smithsonian, these are usually PhD scientists or historians, and I said, have you got anything from South Georgia? And they said, where's South Georgia? And the collections aren't organized by South Georgia, you know, that's not, that's not the way it works. Uh, so I had to tell them where South Georgia was, at least in my own mind. So we start out here, that's Douglas, Georgia, in Coffee County, way down south in southeast Georgia. Uh, and I started thinking about, as I was seeing some of the early things in the collections, many of them were flora and fauna. Uh, gnats, for example. Smithsonian has a big collection of gnats. And South Georgia has lots of gnats. But, <laughs> Gnats don't stay in one place, they wander around. So I couldn't say that this was gonna be a Coffee County gnat. Gnats are just endemic to this whole area called the coastal plain. So it became clear to me that the only logical way to, to define this whole book territory was to say South Georgia as defined by the coastal plain because the coastal plain is a very special part, physiographic part of Georgia. Below, above that, above the so-called fall line, which is actually a zone, is the Piedmont, which is a clay soils, the soils you have here in the foothills. And then you come down to the coastal plain, which is more sandy soils. And you have a lot of swamps and standing water. It's very level ground. Now, why is that? Because that was underwater for millions and millions of years. Now, I learned a lot of things in this book, a tidbit of uh, trivia for you. Georgia has a state fossil. How many people know what the state fossil is? Okay. Okay, it's a shark's tooth. The reason it's a shark's tooth is that there are abundant collections of shark tooth can be found in the coastal plain because it used to be under the water. So the coastal plain is kind of a very special place from the point of view of how the soils and how the flora and fauna behave and what they are. So that was the first part of the definition. Secondly, I had to include my family in this story because it was gonna be about my family and my family is part of it. I grew up in this small town. My mother and father ran the Clough Ice and Coal plant that's shown over here on the left. It's a typical small town that you'll see just about anywhere in the south, particularly in South Georgia. Uh, that's a celebration of the centennial of the county in 1954. It's a big deal for, for Douglas, Georgia. One of the things you'll see in this, this photograph, if you look around, is that it is a very integrated crowd watching that parade. But in fact, this was a time of segregation. So the important thing was it's a small town, everybody lived together, and everybody sort of mixed throughout the community in a way, even though segregation was the way of life there. So that, uh, my family comes into this picture, and I'm, I'll, I'll comment on that very briefly in a minute. The third thing is, in order to be in this book, 
there has to be a connection to the Smithsonian collections in some way. Now the Smithsonian collections, Smithsonian was founded in 1846. It had inherited some collections at that time and then added collections over time. Uh, today, the collections number 154.5 million artifacts, specimens, and works of art. 154.5 million. Now, when I wrote an earlier book about the Smithsonian, I said 134, but that's because the collections have grown because the Smithsonian added a collection of worms. The Department of Agriculture had worms in their collections and they said, we can't handle them anymore. The Smithsonian, for the nation's benefit, kept those the collection of worms. So it grows over time depending upon what shows up on the doorstep, but they don't randomly look for them. <laughs> on, on the left-hand side here is, is a bird collection. And the birds show up in one of the chapters, a very important chapter. And there are 660,000 items in the bird collection in the Smithsonian, 660,000. And appropriately, the head curator for the bird collection is Dr. Carla Dove. <laughs> First time. And she's a really brilliant woman, a delightful woman. So birds get into the story. I'm a geological engineer, so I love gems and minerals. There are about 650,000, 600,000 600, or so gems and minerals. The Smithsonian keeps the National Ore and Rock Collection for the United States this is, uh, for commercial reasons to study whether or not there's mineralogical prospects in anything that's found somewhere. So it's a very big job for the Smithsonian. Some of the collections are national collections like meteorites. The Smithsonian is designated to be the national repository, and some are not. But the collections are amazing things. People say, why do they grow? Well, they don't grow randomly, but the Smithsonian, for example, keeps a collection of, of election paraphernalia. We have elections every year, and so the Smithsonian collects items from, from the campaigns as part of the American history story. So there are things that grow automatically. You can't really stop them. But there are Smithsonian collections for just about anything you can imagine. And that helped me in my search to find things about the Smithsonian. But it was a little bit like a needle in a haystack. So as I would talk to my curators, and I was using the digital search engine where I could, but there wasn't much digitized at the time, I would tell them what I was doing what I wanted. And so Rusty Russell was a curator of the botany collection. So 1.2 million specimens, botanical specimens, 200,000 of which are type specimens. That is, they are the specimen that was used to identify a species. So the very, very rare kind of collection. Rusty knew I loved and was interested in the longleaf pine. The longleaf pine used to be forest of longleaf pines up and down the coast. And William Bartram, when he came through Georgia in the 1775 era, talked about walking through massive forest of longleaf pine. And when the English settlers got into it and, and realized what a beautiful tree it was, they cut them down. My, my relatives were timber people. Almost all the longleaf pines were cut down, but fortunately not all, and people are trying to restore some of it. It's a very important story. So he said, uh, when he called me up, Dr. Clough, I think I've got something for you. And I said, okay, I'm coming. And that's a, my favorite words were, I think I got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I go into Rusty Russell's shop, and there is a, a, several things, but there is this specimen. And it's a longleaf pine specimen, clearly, very beautifully laid out. And he said, read the placket down at the bottom. The placket down at the bottom says, this specimen was collected in February of 1903 in Douglas, Georgia. Out of 1.2 million specimens, this one came from Douglas, Georgia. So I read a little bit more and, and as I kept reading, it said it was collected by Roland Harper. So I said, who the heck's Roland Harper? That's him. And it turned out it changed the character of the book because I realized that the collector of these things was just as interesting oftentimes as the specimen itself. So Roland Harper turns out to be one of the most renowned botanists who ever lived in, south, in, in the southeast of our country. And he ended up uh, being, uh, working at the University of Alabama uh, and being really just, just sort of found of the field of botany uh, in southeast Georgia. He's an amazing guy. He also had some other characteristics that were not so nice. I'm not going to go into those. <laughs> I'll leave that as said. But here's the point. How many of you know collectors who are, are, are obsessive? <laughs> Sandy? <laughs> They're all unusual people. It's been my way of thinking. And Roland Harper was no different. So every time I got close to a collector, they were different. The other question is, why did Roland Harper 
send his items to the Smithsonian, and then thirdly, what was he doing in Douglas at that time? He was working on his PhD at Columbia University. And he loved the Smithsonian. He sent lots of specimens. He also had an, an aesthetic, an aesthetic, about how his specimens should be prepared. So this almost looks like a Zen painting. Everything he prepared was some very specially done. He was a unique, obsessive person. That became part of the story. A second, that was one data point. The second data point was I got that call. I think we've got something for you. So I go over to the paleontology group. Seven million paleontological specimens in the artifacts, fossils in the artifacts. They said, we got one for you. And there was one out of seven million. And this happened to be a jawbone of a creature that lived about 13,000 years ago. And it was a big creature. In fact, that's what it looks like in the bottom. That was in the old hall of dinosaurs at the Smithsonian. It's now been resurrected in the new deep time hall. That's Kirk Johnson, the head of the museum, telling me how his hips work. That was bigger than an elephant. Bigger than an elephant. And its name was um, Eremotherium. And it is a giant ground sloth. And it was a vegetarian, thank goodness. Isn't that nice? If that thing was coming at you, you would think, oh, poof. But it would grab a tree and just eat all the leaves. That was the way this animal lived and worked. And so those big claws, and it's a fascinating story, and there's a whole chapter in the book on this. But as is the case, <coughs> Whenever someone invited me over and I said, gosh, this is amazing, fine. This one was special because it's the first one ever found in North America. It was found on Skidaway Island outside of Savannah. One had been found in South America, but this is the first one. So it identified a species that lived in South Georgia. This giant ground sloth 13,000 years ago lived in South Georgia. So you sit down and you think about it for a while and say, where did they go? Why aren't they still here? I mean, we go to Africa to see giraffes and rhinoceroses and elephants. Why don't we have giant ground sloths? The answer is, that's part of the story. And it's part of the story of the book. Okay, so it's an important part of the story. The real answer is, it's a question of chain. It's a question of collision of cultures. Because it so happens, another mammal species showed up in South Georgia about 13,000 years ago. Collision. Outcome, that animal gets extinct. As do other animals connected to this animal. There were many such animals that lived in Georgia at the time. So, I'm going to just quickly run through to say, as I went through the collections, everywhere I went, I found something that was interesting to me. I happen to love fox squirrels. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a fox squirrel. It's about twice as big as a regular squirrel. Most of them run around on the ground. They don't spend much time in trees. But the interesting thing, that's Chris Helgen, who's the chief curator of mammals. And he just took, pulled out this drawer and he said, these are all from South Georgia. And he said, what's amazing to me, and I never thought about it, he said, but these are the most colorful specimens of fox squirrels we have in all of our collections. And there were hundreds of thousands of them. I said, that's great. South Georgia, the most colorful fox squirrel. I love it. <laughs> uh, this thing on the right-hand side, uh, American History coming up, we think we got something for you. And they pull out a drawer, and they say, we know you're interested in Civil War history too. And there's a uniform and a badge that was worn by William Sherman on the march to the sea. Went right through South Georgia. His uniform, he was a relatively small guy, incidentally. But that badge was unique because he designed it himself. And on the back of it, on the back of it, it's hard to see for you, it said, worn by w General W.T. Sherman on the march to the sea. When I grew up as a boy, I was all ta always taught to hate General Sherman. <laughs> but later on, I learned he wasn't that bad a guy after all. But uh, he did what he had to do to win the war. But there it was, right there in the Smithsonian collection. Native American story is an amazing story in South Georgia and North Georgia, as you know, with the Etowah Mounds. And we're connected because the Native Americans who lived here had connections to Native Americans who lived down the Savannah River in South Georgia. And the culture that's here, you can actually see migrating right downstream to those mounds that I visited in, in, and wrote about in the book. Just absolutely stunning and amazing to see the work that they did, the, the, the pottery that they made. It's remarkable. The culture just disappeared. And it's another story about collisions of cultures. One European comes to America in 1540, named Hernando de Soto, with pigs. And that one person causes disease which wiped out a culture. 
But the pigs are still here. Go to Abbeville, Georgia, wild hog capital of America. And you can go down in the summer and eat wild hog sausages. And they are descended from the Soto's pigs. And of course, being a yellow jacket myself, I had to ask the entomologist, got any yellow jackets? Absolutely, 11,000 of them. <laughs> and these guys are from South Georgia and Atlanta. So they're represented in the, in the collections. In all the collections work that I did, I still knew I had to go down to South Georgia. I couldn't stop by just going in the collections. So I met, took many trips to South Georgia to try to understand what I'd seen in the collections and to make connections and so forth. Uh, and so I learned to love the Eastern Indigo Snake, which is an endangered snake, a beautiful snake. Uh, and there's a story associated with that one. My friend Frankie Snow, who lived, grew up three doors from me and was one of my gophers when I was uh, building things as a kid, became a world expert on Swift Creek pottery. The Smithsonian has Swift Creek pottery. It also has snakes, the uh, Eastern Indigo Snake. And these folks lived probably 2,000 years ago, before the people that built the mound. They made beautiful pottery. Pitts, Georgia has to do with the meteorite. The Smithsonian has the National Meteorite Collection. And they have a, a meteorite there called a Pitts meteorite, which is a very famous meteorite. I held it in my hand. Beautiful, beautiful meteorite. And I visited Pitts twice because the first time I went, I was in error, turned out. I learned, learned and I had to go back again. So that's part of the story. The Kant Woodmanston Plantation is a rice plantation between Brunswick and Savannah. Uh, it's a story that has to do with birds, but it got into the collector's part and two interesting brothers, Joseph and, and uh, John LeConte, who crossed, I crossed their paths throughout my life and I never knew it. I went to Berkeley to work on my PhD and I took classes in LeConte Hall. I couldn't afford to park on campus and I parked on LeConte Drive about four blocks away. LeConte's were founders of the University of California, Berkeley. They grew up in South Georgia. They went there because of the Civil War, but they were also bird collectors, but they also were at the Smithsonian and gave lectures there. So my life intertwined with theirs. And lastly, a tree. Uh, so this is a long story about this tree, but this tree, it turns out, is a place where my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather had a turpentine store. And they had a store right under that tree. And that store, that tree is today is known as the Village Sentinel. And it is the grand champion in Georgia. It's the largest live oak tree. Don't believe anybody else who says there's bigger. And it's still growing, 350 years old, and it's still growing. So I had to go down and see that tree. Now, what does it have to do with the Smithsonian collections? Well, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which I helped build, planted live oaks all around that museum. So that's the connection to the Smithsonian. So I found incredible numbers of collections. The bottom line is, after all these data points, is what's the story? And the story is the story of change. Remember now, I went in thinking I was gonna write a book about something that might be over 100 years. It's now back to 13,000 years. And I thought I was gonna be writing mainly about people, now I'm writing about animals. So the story got bigger, longer, and over time, much larger. And you march all the way back from 13,000 years to almost today, and you find a story of change, a story of gains and losses. We lost some beautiful creatures in the process of doing this. It'd be wonderful if we hadn't lost them, but it's the way it works in, in civilization. So this, that's a part of the lesson. So Jose, that's it. We can talk. Thank you. So have a seat, Wayne. For those of you who already have a book, you're really in for a treat. Uh, it, it's a, a delightful combination of autobiography, uh, a peek into the Smithsonian, and really uh, uh, just getting to know a lot of people that you've met or that, uh, that you discovered uh, in, in your process. Mm -hmm. But I really want to go back. I really want to go back to this Tom Sawyer childhood that you had that uh, you know, most of us don't have any. In fact, I think few kids will have nowadays. So talk about your childhood and how that really affected yeah. the, the, the outlook that you well, conveyed I, in your I, book. I was very fortunate to grow up when I did and had loving parents, like we didn't have a lot of money. But we had a great family and because they had come from farming families, we had many relatives. So I had lots of relatives on farms. We could go visit them in the farm. And uh, I had a passion as a child to be outside. I wanted to be outside all the time. And it, it 
it made me uh, uh, see nature in all of its aspects, and I became uh, fascinated by nature and, and what nature, how it looked, and all those kind of things. And that's one of the sort of the themes in the book is all those things I saw as a child, I began to ask myself, why did we have all these things? Where did they come from? And there's, there's an answer for why everything is there, which is part of the story. But growing up there was really good for me. I, I, I you know, was a fairly good student, but I love being out of doors. And, my parents both worked. They co-owned that ice and coal plant. They, they both, I was always a latchkey kid. I, I wandered all around all the time if I could. I never had shoes on. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I could walk on a pitch tar road and it never bothered me in those days because my feet were so hard. Uh, but it was a great place to grow up and be surrounded by people who love you. Probably if I'd grown up in a city, I'd been thrown in jail because I got in trouble. But down there they would say, oh, okay, let's get this kid around and whip him a little bit and he'll straighten up. So. It was a great place to grow up as a child, but to stimulate my imagination, we didn't have uh, computers, obviously, and we didn't have television. Uh, so you know, it was radio, imagination, and, and imagining yourself to be Tom Sawyer and imagining all things about when you're out in the woods. And you never went to the swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, swimming pools were, well, we had a swimming pool, but that was boring. We loved to go out to Tiller River and some of the rivers around, and uh, that was a little scary because these are called black rivers and because the tannins uh, are from the, the leaves that fall into the, into the rivers don't go away, they just sit there because the river doesn't have enough current to take them away. So when you jump in, you never quite know what's in there with you. <laughs> so I understand that the first kid to splash down was the one who, who scared off the snakes. Was that you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so fast forward uh, through your illustrial, illustrious career as, a as an academic and the pinnacle should have been president of Georgia Tech and then retirement, but then you became secretary of the Smithsonian. How did that happen? <laughs> I guess I'm a glutton for punishment, but the, what, what happened in, in life is, is because I have lots of interests, I got to know a lot of people. And in the cor as that works out in life, people remember you in some way. And so they recommend you when positions come up. So, a number of my friends knew I was getting ready to retire at Georgia Tech, and one was Walter Massey, who had been president of Morehouse, who was a distinguished physicist, he'd been head of NSF, and Walter and I were co-presidents at that time, and, and he, he and I really synced together in terms of the way we thought, and we really liked each other. Well, Walter had been on the regents of the board of the Smithsonian. That's the board that governs the Smithsonian. It's an unusual board, because it was created in terms of its structure in 1846, and the chancellor of the Smithsonian is the Chief Justice of the United States. The Smithsonian is not an executive branch, and it's not a federal branch. It's a private, partly private institution. So I reported to John Roberts, which was an interesting phenomenon, because it was really fascinating to report to him. But so Walter also happened to be on the search committee. <laughs> so he said, I, when they got looking around, and he was looking at the council, say, hey, wait a minute, I know a guy that's down at Georgia Tech. He, he knows how to deal with difficult situations. Uh, Jack Thompson is here. Remember when I came to Georgia Tech, we were having a few problems. He said, I saw him do that once, and the Smithsonian had just had a major problem with the former secretary. And they said, this guy can sort of fix things up, and he knows how to raise money. And the Smithsonian is a lot like a public university because it's partially public, partially private, and you have to raise money for it just like you do at a university. You don't have a football team, thank God. <laughs> Oh, but that, so the, another very good friend of mine was the president of MIT, and he was very close friends with a Smithsonian board member, and Chuck Vest recommended me. So those two people were the people that got me into the, the process. But I, when I did it, and you would know this yourself, I was not a museum person. I loved the Smithsonian. I've been there many, many times, but I didn't know much about it. And I got into the search process, and I did my work that I needed to do. I realized the Smithsonian was founded to be a science institution. And for almost 100 years, it did not have an art museum. And, and art came to the Smithsonian much, much later. Uh, and I love art. I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable about it particularly, but I love it. And I certainly figured out I could handle the science part. You know, when, when I went to Georgia State, uh, Georgia State did not have a football team either. So <laughs> don't put it past them to, for there to be a Smithsonian <laughs> football team in the future. Uh, you, you, you spoke about the collection, and that's a, that's a just a description that you wrote that I, that I love, so if you don't mind, indulge me to read it. The, describing the, the Smithsonian collections, um, there are 145 million scientific specimens, 10 million cultural objects, and 450,000 works of art. 
there are 350,000 banknotes, 2,200 live animals at the National Zoo, and two 1933 St. Gaudens double eagle gold coins. There is only one Hope Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I love that quote, but I also, you know, looking at the photograph of a drawer with 20 birds or, or, or mineral specimens, I, I've seen drawers with, you know, with, with uh, hundreds of uh, Indian artifacts. Um, this vast collection of, the, uh, of, of the Smithsonian, why, why so much stuff? What is the <laughs> purpose? Well, the Smithsonian was really founded to document uh, our natural history of our country. You, and you, you, you kind of forget, but the flora and fauna in, in the United States or North America was completely new to people in Europe. Uh, most, many of the things that we had here had never been seen before. And so when the Smithsonian started, they were collecting things in essence to save and preserve parts of the, our natural history that were going to disappear. And it was, conservation was very much part of the Smithsonian. When, for example, we didn't have a zoo until about 1900, and they realized when they looked at the west part of the United States, buffalo were disappearing, just to take that as an example. And so a group was sent out from the Smithsonian to see if they could collect some buffalo, and that, in those days that meant shoot them, and, and bring them back and see what could be done to save them. Well, the people who went out there felt real bad about shooting them, and they brought back live ones. And so all of a sudden, the secretary of the Smithsonian is looking, oh, God, I got five buffalo out here. <laughs> And well, they said, yeah, but we gotta learn how to breed them, you know, so we can help them and so forth. And so pretty soon somebody said, after about two or three years of these buffalo being out back of the Smithsonian, they said, God, get them out of here. <laughs> and so that's how the National Zoo came to be. But the National Zoo is all about conservation of a huge endangered species. Thing. So that's where the, the live specimens come. Uh, but the collections themselves then tell our story. It's not just the natural history collection. It's everything about our culture. Our whole story of our culture as a country is in the collection. And that was the thing that really, I'll tell you one quick story, was uh, just an example. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's writing desk. And actually it's, it's shown off and on. When Thomas Jefferson was working on the, writing the Declaration of Independence, he would ride back and forth on a horse. And he designed a desk that could be opened up and see two pages at a time that would fit in a saddlebag. So it's his desk, and he wrote the Declaration of Independence on it. Now, the Declaration of Independence, that, that's a very important artifact, and it tells a story. Every artifact tells a story. That's the other beautiful thing about writing a book in this way. And so you think about it, let's, how long is the United States going to exist? I don't know. Let's hope 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, the United States is still here. That desk should still be here. Everything should still be here for people to see so they can understand their history. So the difficult part of the collections, and you know this well, is when you take something into the collections, you have to take care of it forever. You have to, you know, I used to love, I said, I, when I moved into my office, I wanted a Babe Ruth baseball. They said, you can't have it. And the reason I couldn't have it wasn't because I was not a nice guy, but because the temperature and light and humidity in my office would not sustain the signature. So everything has to be in a condition where it's controlled, temperature, heat, and humidity all throughout all those 155 million things, which is an enormous responsibility. But it's fascinating, and the people who take care of these things are scientists or art historians that, are, that have knowledge of the collections beyond imagining. You know, you talked about these early explorers exposed to this new flora and fauna here, and, and I think the title of the book comes from, uh, comes from one of them, Things New and Strange. Yeah, well, the title of the book comes from this idea that when early people, early visitors came to the United States, they were stunned by the things they saw. They were stunned to see a raccoon. You don't see raccoons in Europe or Asia. So uh, when a real naturalist came here to document these things, one of the first was a guy named Mark Catesby. Uh, he stayed here for, five, for four years, 19, 1722 to 1726. And he documented, mostly in the southeast and in south areas of Georgia. And he documented these beautiful, he's one of these artists who could illustrate and draw these beautiful paintings of birds and and flora and fauna. And he, he, he wrote these books later when he got back to England. And in 1741, he finished volume two, and his sponsor was the Princess of Wales. And so he wrote a letter of transmittal to her, and he said, Dear Madam, I present to you things new and strange that no one has ever seen in Britain or in Europe. And the interesting thing about that, when you think about it, when I grew up as a boy, I took for granted everything I saw. But, you know, 
Possums are unique creatures, as, as are alligators. They don't have them in, in Europe. I mean, these are all really amazing creatures. And so they were considered new and strange at that time. And, and over time, we've gotten accustomed to them. But they're still interesting creatures. They're still amazing creatures. Well, let's talk about one creature. And, and one the story that really intrigued me, because it really came together your, your, your hometown, um, um, the, the fauna here, and the National Zoo, which is a connection between the indigo snake the National Two, and your grandfather, Klaus Farm. <laughs> well, one of the peculiar things about this study that I did was there were always surprises, and there were always surprises. And the other thing, as you get into it, you realize, particularly because the Smithsonian collections extend you across time, that meteorite I was looking at was 4.5 billion years old, as old as the beginning of our solar system. And so what happens is things get connected, get connected in odd ways that there were these coincidences. Uh, in my own family story, that's part of the book, uh, my father had had a traumatic childhood event in that he grew up on a farm, 8,000 acre farm in South Georgia in Jeff Davis County. Uh, and my grandfather was a great horseman, but not a good businessman. And he lost the entire farm in about 1922. And he told the older family members like my father, you have to go find a job, I can't take care of you anymore. And so, uh, he left and eventually worked his way back to Douglas. But the odd thing about it for me was, we would go visit my relatives, and I didn't know it at the time, but we were pretty close to uh, the Jeff Davis County, and, and in, they lived in Jeff Davis County. We were pretty close to where that old farm was. He never took me there. And I think it was because it was such a difficult thing for him to have given up a beautiful part of his life, and it just zeroed out on him there. And I think he never, he never thought about ever taking me out there. So I always wanted to see my grandfather's old farm. Now Frankie Snow, this a very unique individual who I, uh, lived in uh, Douglas all these years, is also a bit of a local historian. And he used the tax records with another friend of his and found out where that farm was. And so on a day we were doing a visit with Frankie to see things, he said, I'll take you to see your grandfather's old farm. And we drove down this paved road into the dirt road and there's a fence there. He said, that's it. It's 8,000 acres of a big farm. Uh, and as you look across, what I saw was a sign from the Department of Natural Resources of Georgia and said, this is a protected area for natural resources because of the indigo snake and the gopher tortoise, two species that are in danger because we cut all the pine trees down. They live in typically longleaf pine forest. So what I found was when I'm walking out there in my grandfather's old farm, it's now saved because of two animals. And there was a fellow there by the name of Dirk Stevenson who works for the Orion Society who's working to save the Eastern Indigo Snake, which is the largest native snake to America. It's non-poisonous, it's a beautiful snake, but it's big. It eats rattlesnakes, just to put it in perspective. So Dirk says, I'll get you one. And sure enough, bang, out he comes. He said, this is the female, I don't know how he knew that. But he handed it to me, and this thing curled itself around my arm. He said, don't worry, it's non-poisonous. I, I believe okay. you have a picture of that in the book. <laughs> but uh, then I asked him, you know, a simple question. I said, Dirk, have you ever been to the Smithsonian? And he said, not for about 20 years. He said, but your people were here not long ago. I said, what? My people were here? Yeah, he says, you're endangered species people. They came and collected specimens from this area. So now I learn, while I'm standing in my grandfather's old farm that I've never seen before, that two snakes, so go east and indigo snakes, are in the National Zoo. My cousins, if you will, in the National Zoo. <laughs> and I didn't know it. And so the uh, first thing I did when I got back was to go see my cousins in the zoo, and there they were. Uh, <laughs> doing quite well, getting ready to breed. Uh, but the other part of it was there's a place called Rocky Hammock Landing, part of the story. My mother and her father came down the river from uh, Trutland County to a new home in Jeff Davis County on a riverboat in 1904 when my mother was two. <clears throat> and they, all their belongings, their sheep, their cows, everything, because they bought a farm in Jeff Davis County. They got off at Rocky Hammock Landing, and Frankie took me to see Rocky Hammock Landing. And Rocky Hammock Landing is on my grandfather's old farm. So the place where my mother came to get off the riverboat when she was two, and my father was two, he was living on that farm. And that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but there are all of these strange coincidences uh, they're all connected. You know, it shows you that the world really is connected. So, uh, a more serious question. You, you, you dealt with, uh, in some cases, brilliant scientists, but we're also not very nice people in, in certain ways. Uh, some of them were, were racist. Uh, there were some slave owners. 
Uh, you talked about recent extinctions, but, but you worked that into the book. Uh, uh, and, and so tell me about the thought process to, that you used to acknowledge these things without really getting, uh, turning the book into much of a downer, uh, to, to, for lack of a better word. Well, I mean, people in general aren't perfect. Okay, so what you're gonna find is that people who might excel at science aren't necessarily nice people in some other way. Some are racist and some have other difficulties and challenges in their life. But as I got into the book, I realized that this story was a very big story and that if, as I thought about my own upbringing and going to school in Douglas, Georgia, I studied Georgia history as we were required in those days. And I didn't realize at that time the Georgia history curriculum had basically been rewritten by the Daughters of the Confederacy. And in starting in about late 1800s, early 1900s, the Daughters of the Confederacy, and there may have been good motivations at the time, wanted to capture the story of the Confederacy in a different way than it had been captured in history. And they rewrote it, and for example, the story of slavery was told through the picture of states' rights, that the Civil War was fought because of states' rights. And as I got into the new American History Museum of African American History and Culture, and I saw their artifacts about slavery, I realized that slavery was a big industry in Georgia, and I'd never understood that. So 1860, the, in the population consisted in Georgia of a million people. 450,000 of them were enslaved. Now, you can't have 450,000 of a workforce and not have a big industry to suppress them, to bring them here when there's turnover, if you will, people die. It was, and so I dug further and further into it, to the story, uh, into the story of slavery. And I said, you know, this is really something people need to understand, that this was a brutal way of life. People were considered property. And if you look at all the secession documents, it was all about, you're gonna take my property away. And the property were slaves. And that was an inhuman way of life. Uh, so I felt that you had to tell the whole story, and I tried to do that in the book. Uh, and, and the idea is that, in, in fact, I think it's a much more interesting way to look at history than to think of it as a simplistic thing. That everybody was happy, go lucky, and having a good time. You know, in fact, around the Civil War, there's a lot of poverty. In South Georgia, when I grew up there, there was a lot of poverty. There's a lot of sad situations where people weren't educated. I would go out in the countryside. Black and white tenant farmers could hardly speak English. And so it was a tough time, and it wasn't a happy time. And you, I don't think you need to, you know, there were good times, there were good families, there were good people, without question. But at the same time, you need to tell the whole story. So I think it's important that that be done. And I, and I will commend you for acknowledging without dwelling on, on, on these issues, but still making, a, making an important point. Yep. Uh, I thought that was a, on a, on a less serious note, I gotta ask this. All <laughs> right, so why is a book written by the president of the Georgia Institute of Technology, published by the University of Georgia Press. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> A fairly good question. Uh, <laughs> so the good news was I had several options to publish the book, and I wasn't sure about where I was going. The Smithsonian would have published the book without question, but they have a contract with Harper's, and they published my earlier books. But this book I felt, again, I had this really powerful connection to this book and where I came from. And there's no question that the best regional press in the Southeast, frankly, is the University of Georgia Press. Uh, I have a good friend, and then I do, and, and big canoe named Chuck Knapp, who used to be the president of the University of Georgia. And he and I got along really well. I didn't get along with all the presidents of the University of Georgia. I got along well with Chuck. And when I, I, we bought our house in big canoe, I told Chuck about this book, and he's on the University of Georgia Press. Uh, and I said, I thought this was the right place to publish the book. I said, but I know it might seem a little strange. And so I think he ran a little interference for me. Uh, but uh, the folks on the, on the board, I've gotten to know them. They're really wonderful people. Uh, and they thought this was a book that was perfect for them. Uh, it's a history it told in a different way. Uh, and, and it represents a great collaboration between two great institutions. And these politically divisive, divisive times, this is maybe, maybe gives us a little, a little bit of hope for the future. <laughs> um, you end the book with Jimmy Carter. Yep. Why? I, well, I had to end somewhere. I was getting, you know, I've been working on this for six years and my wife was saying, come on, get oh, this thing over with. So uh, I, I realized I could keep going right on up into today's time, but the, you know, you start running out of artifacts and museums a little bit because you aren't in the history of it. Uh, so the interesting thing to me was that Jimmy Carter, I read all of his books, and they're in the Smithsonian collections. He, Jimmy Carter is the most represented Georgian 
in the Smithsonian collection. Not only is his presidential portrait there, but many other things are there. And I read his books, particularly his childhood book. His, you could read his childhood, and if I wrote a book like that, it'd be the same thing. Mm -hmm. We grew up in almost the same, certainly would be the same story for my parents. Uh, and so he was born in 1924. He grew up in that time of poverty, no electricity, all those things. He fished, we fished in the same river. Uh, and so uh, I also thought that he was the person who represented the transition out of the shadow of the Civil War and out of the Jim Crow era and, and the shift into something different and better, if you will. And so I decided to, it was easy to put him in the book because he's in the collection. And I, I knew I had to interview him and I was able to do that. And he was very gracious, spent a lot of time with me. Uh, and and I, I, so I, one of the questions I asked him because it related to this, how did we get out from under this? Although he had many other stories to tell me, which were fascinating too. Incidentally, he and his father collected an enormous number of Native American artifacts. So just like the collections in the Smithsonian, his collections go back 13,000 years. That was a deep history of Native Americans living in South Georgia. But I asked him, what do you think it was that finally broke the back of this oppressive cycle? And he said, without hesitation, civil rights. He said, the first thing that changed the world was Harry Truman integrating the armed forces. And the second thing, he said, you know, if you can send people off to die for this country, they shouldn't have to come back and be second class citizens. The second thing was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So now, instead of having a society where only a few people had access to success and education and so forth, you had a place where at least not only everybody would have access to it, and you would have the opportunities for every smart person to succeed who could succeed. And you really are going to have a, a more fulfilling culture, a culture that's going to be more successful. And I see it today when I see young African Americans at Georgia Tech from South Georgia, really smart kids and they're gonna make great contributors to this country. So I, I think he was exactly right about that. Uh, and it was marvelous to end it that way. He was a terrific uh, way to end the book. Yeah, my final question is, uh, you, you had unique access to the Smithsonian's collection uh, for your project, but you think we can all do that. Uh, how, how, how can we do that? How can we access the Smithsonian's collection? Well, the, the, of course, uh, you can become secretary of the Smithsonian. <laughs> That's probably not going to happen right away. Uh, but I was a big proponent of the digitization when I went there, and the Smithsonian was woefully behind in use of technology in many ways. Uh, but having grown up in Douglas, I realized, you know, my parents paid for the Smithsonian in their taxes, but they never got to access it. I never got to access it as a kid. And that if we really wanted to make this a holistic institution to serve the whole country, we need to have more access, that's a key word. And digitization would be the way to do that. Digitization of collections, as you know, serves many purposes. First, it documents your collection in a very profound way. And, and then in addition, when scholars come, and let's say those scholars come to see those, those type specimens in botany. Well, when they handle them, you have to take them out of a cabinet. You might break them. You gotta make sure they get back in the same place. It's a painfully, difficult process. If it's digitized, they don't have to come, and they don't have to handle them. They may find one or two they want to have. So digitization means that from a collector's point of view, curator's point of view, you're saving your specimens and you're preserving your specimens. And then finally, it means the public can access them. Now, then you have to come up with ways for the public to actually know they're getting at something they want to see, and that makes it more difficult. Just a quick story. So. We have 66,000 bumblebees at the Smithsonian. We didn't know that until we did digitization in Sonoma. Bumblebees are very important pollinators. Pollinators, as you may know, are in trouble. People want to study the digital collection, or the, 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 the collection of the Smithsonian. So we decided to digitize the bumblebee collection. But taking a high resolution image of a bumblebee and putting it on the web doesn't help one bit. Because you've got to know where that bumblebee came from. You've got to know who collected it and what its species did. And there are two tags on each bumblebee specimen that say that. So when we digitized the bumblebee, we digitized the tags. And then we worked up and had a transcription center so anybody in the world can help us digitize those two tags because our curators don't have time to do it. Those tags are the way you get keywords to connect you to the specimen. So it's a difficult process, but it's a process that's well worth it. They now have, when they started, when I started, there were one million, now there's almost 15 million. Wow. So you can do a lot of things on yourself to satisfy your own personal curiosity.
I would suggest if you want to do a little bit of what I did, and some of the work I did later on was more or less with the digital search engine, is uh, don't start with your name or your personal town. Work your way out from out to in. So choose a battlefield, choose a geologic formation, choose something that's out there that you could start with and that you figure there will be a connection to the collections and, and go there and then work your way down to the more specific. And you'll find lots of things about yourself. I, I learned more about my family than I ever imagined through the collections. Yeah, uh, I lied. One more question. Uh, uh, Civil War, uh, how you found uh, families, your, your family fought on both sides and you actually found some of your northern family members in South Georgia. Can you well, I grew up in the South and you, you know, you're inculcated with that Southern culture, you know, especially back in those days. Uh, and you, you know, you, you, you don't think, you think about the Yankees, right? <laughs> and the war between the states and that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that was what I grew up with. And all I knew was that my great grandfather had fought in the Civil War as a cavalryman. Uh, he had joined, I didn't know it at the time, but he had joined in 1864 late at 18 years old. Fortunately survived or I wouldn't be here. But that was all I knew. I did know that there was a part of a Clough family that was in New England. It turns out my family, actually most of it's in New England. Uh, the first Clough came over in 1635, settled. He was a go forth and multiply kind of guy, so 57 grandchildren. <laughs> they, they populated all of New England, and in, after the War of 1812, they started to spread out into the Native American lands that had been taken away from the Native Americans. And the Creek Indians were a perfect example here in Georgia. 24 million acres of land became available in 1814 after Andrew Jackson defeated the Creek Indians. And so a lot of people from New England who were landlocked came to Georgia and, and got land through lotteries and so forth. And my great great grandfather came at that time. So uh, what was curious to me was, why did my great grandfather, who was just one generation away from his, all of his relatives, fight for the South? I don't know the answer to that. I think there is an answer, but I won't go into it right now. But the, so then I asked myself the question, well, where were all my northern relatives? Well, 400 of my relatives fought for the Union. And then I asked myself the Seminole question, because there is a Union facility in, there's a, sorry, there's a war facility in South Georgia called Andersonville Prison. It's where the Union soldiers were kept for one year. One got off with summer, 35,000 of them, and 13,000 died. And I went to the registry at the, the Andersonville prison. You can put your name in. Five cluffs came up. Five of my relatives from the north. And I looked up each one of them. Each one of them fought in a different battle. And by the luck of the draw, got sent to Andersonville. And two of them are buried in mass grave down there. So they have headstones, not of gravestones. Clara Barton and others came down after the war and identified as many of the people who were in that mass grave as possible and gave them headstones. And you can go find the headstone of your relative. So two of my relatives died while they were there. A third got out but died in Marietta. He's buried at here Marietta, and two survived. Uh, so that was kind of a, you know, when I'm down there in a beautiful day in November and the headstones are gleaming and you think about all these men, these young men who went down there, they just joined the army. They got thrown into Andersonville they must have thought something better was in store for them than to die of dysentery in South Georgia. It was a sad, sad state of affairs. And it's a very elegant photograph of you standing behind a headstone yeah. with the name Clough yeah. uh, on it. Yeah. So these are, again, it's the kind of thing, because of the collections, you learn about these things. So I thought, we thought we'd wrap it up with uh, uh, Dr. Clough reading uh, the last paragraph of the book. I don't know if you want to read your copy or read from the book. Yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I, have a, I have it in here. <laughs> Big print. Bigger print, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, when I finished writing the book, it was, I was trying to find a way to say it. I'm not sure if I said it well, but this is the way it goes. Thomas Wolfe assured us we can't go home again. And he was right in the sense that both Douglas and I have changed in the intervening decades. But writing this book allowed me to return to my home and learn, not just about the flora and fauna and the history of the place, but about myself and my family. The learning was never in a straight line and came often as not as a surprise. I was left to ponder how seemingly coincidences connect, how seeming coincidences connected events and people across time and space, 
in ways unexpected. In the words of John Muir, pick out anything in the universe and we find it hitched to everything else. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. <laughs> Wang Kwa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we do have time for a few questions, and uh, when, when you do ask, I'll repeat the question for the benefit of uh, everyone. Uh, and so, uh, questions, please. Yes, sir. I'm curious about your personal journey from South Texas to Berkeley and Stanford. What, South Texas or South Georgia? Pardon? S South Georgia, you meant. Right, right. The, the question is, uh, uh, a gentleman is, is curious about uh, his journey from South Georgia to Berkeley. <laughs> oh boy, somebody else loves in, in, in the 60s, by the way, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I will, I will because you, I, because, uh, because uh, uh, he preceded you. So uh, before I give you the answer, I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, when I was uh, asked to uh, get involved in the search for the new president, to be the new president of Georgia Tech, uh, got a little latecomer into the search. Uh, you know, you got these search committees with like 50 people. And naturally the question came up, what did you do at Berkeley? <laughs> so I, I just said, I didn't inhale. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I was a young fellow, you know, growing up in a small town and so forth, and then uh, went to Georgia Tech, and because my parents never got to go to college, uh, and they worked so hard to help me in life, and I worked my way through school, I never thought about going to graduate school, and fortunately, as I got for, pretty far in my academic career at Georgia Tech, in those days you didn't have a personal advisor, but uh, a professor said, you know, you're a pretty darn good student, you ought to think about going to graduate school, and I said, I don't have any money. He said, don't worry about it, we'll pay for it. And I said, that's the best deal I've ever heard of. Uh, so I went, I did my master's at Georgia Tech and I, I went out, I worked for two years. Uh, I wanted to get some practical experience. Uh, but I wanted to uh, go back and possibly teach and uh, get involved particularly with the new wave of using computers in civil engineering. Uh, and the University of California, Berkeley and MIT were ranked one and two in civil engineering programs in the world. And so I applied to both of those and was fortunate enough to be accepted. Ann and I talked about it and we said, well, three or four years in California would be a good idea. So we went to Berkeley. No, that's good. But Berkeley was a, I, I knew people, I knew a few people there uh, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on, but it was a, it was a magnificent place to go to school. The, the faculty were fabulous. Uh, I learned so much from them and I'm fully indebted to them and the school's been very nice to me ever since. Uh, but it was just going to a school where, and you know, uh, I'm kind of a public school guy in Berkeley. If you go to Berkeley, the odd thing about Berkeley and Georgia Tech, there are these similarities. It's a ladder school. It's a school that takes a kid like me and says, you know, you've got potential. And if you do this, you can possibly reach your potential. Georgia Tech did that for me and Berkeley did that for me. And they're both great public schools to this day. And there was a lot of crazy stuff. Ann can tell you a story about being tear gassed while she's got our our son up at the Strawberry Canyon where they had, you know, they had precision tear gassing, they call it. And Ronald Reagan was trying, you know, to clear out the commies from Berkeley, which he never did. But, uh, I mean, you know, I learned all kinds of tricks like don't go through low areas on your way to school because the stuff settles in the low areas. You don't want to be tear gassed before you get to work and stuff like that. <laughs> so it was, it was, I learned a lot at Berkeley. <laughs> and, and I just learned something. <laughs> uh, another question, please. Yes. Where is the um, library key that, that encrypts you? Yes, the, the question is where is the, the huge live oak tree that. Uh, oh, oh, okay. That's in Waycross, in Georgia. Which is also in the book. It's just right outside of Waycross. Uh, it's near something called the Kettle Creek Cemetery, which is where all my relatives are buried. Uh, and it's actually in a, on the property of a Baptist retirement home. And so when I learned about this from a cousin of mine that such a tree existed, I went up there, and there was a fellow, you know, a guard, and I said, I, I'm here to see the oak tree. And he's looking at me like I'm a nutcase, right? Uh, and he, I said, it's a really big oak tree. He says, I don't know anything about it, except it's right over there. <laughs> and so I, I was stunned to see this tree and, you know, things holding up the limbs and to think that later on learned that it was there when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Uh, and, and to go back and find out it's the Grand Champion. It's the largest such tree in the state of Georgia, which is another one of these coincidences. And to 
Imagine that the two men who are buried in the Cattle Creek Cemetery, who my great-grandfather and my grandfather once had a store there, and they used to run their life right under that tree. You know, so I, I connected to that tree. Okay, right. we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, yes. Dr. Clark, you mentioned uh, in going back to maybe uh, try to uh, search the background of your family. Uh, my family, my father's side came from uh, Ireland. And I had been to my granddad's home mm -hmm. in Ireland. Uh, he immigrated to the States somewhere 1908, 1910. <coughs> so in starting out and working in, as you described, would I be able to find out some of the background of, of, of him and his family mm -hmm. um, by sort of doing what you suggested? You can't, you can't. And it, you know, the Smithsonian is not probably the first place you start. You start with Ancestry. Ancestry has all the records and they, the, the beauty of my family was they came from New England and they kept very precise records from day one in New England, death records, tax records, you know, census records, all those things. And, you could actually, in, in Ancestry, you can see by decade, you can see the families grow and the families shrink and, uh, and change over time. Now, I had the good fortune also that somebody in the family decided to do a genealogy, and that genealogy was finished in about 1877, but it was very thorough back to this fellow John Clough. So I had, had a very thorough uh, working information. Now, I've been to New England, Northfield, New Hampshire, where my great-grandfather great -grandfather was from, great-great-grandfather was from. And you can see cloths all over the place in cemeteries up there. Uh, but ancestry is the first thing. But the Smithsonian might have something that is of interest, and it's always worth it. It's, it's a sort of a side thing. But sometimes that side thing can turn out to be the most fascinating thing you can imagine. So, you know, I would, I would suggest that you use that as a tool, but I wouldn't start there. But it's always, I mean, it's, you know, be careful what you wish for, too. <laughs> I found some other very interesting things about my family, which I won't share with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, a final question, and this one for me. What is next for Wayne Clough? <laughs> well, uh, my wife can tell you more about that than I can. I <laughs> we, we, shall, shall, shall I give Ann the microphone? <laughs> You're writing history of the time you were at Georgia Tech. Yeah. Because, uh, it wasn't a time when they jumped the freeway That's another story. So, but it's a, so the, the, then Jack would appreciate this. Really, uh, I'm just trying to tell about the decisions that were made. The, oddly enough, George, well, being at the Smithsonian, you realize here's an institution that really values history. National Museum of, of American History, right? The National Portrait Gallery, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. All these things are historical institutions. Uh, but some institutions like Georgia Tech are relatively young, 1885 in terms of its founding. And they don't yet, I think, appreciate their history. In 1985, which was the centennial of Georgia Tech, the, a history was written by a historian, a very remarkable document. But since then, there's been no history written about Georgia Tech, which I think is a real shame. So I'm just trying to document some of the things that happened on my watch so a real historian can someday write around those things. Because there are things that you get to know as a president that other people don't get to know. You, decide, you describe it like a simple project that you know is going to snowball into something bigger. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Dr. Wayne Clough. What, what we're going to do now, I'm going to escort Wayne up to the front uh, to a table where he'll be glad to sign books if you haven't had them signed already or if you have any other questions or anything else you'd like to share with, uh, uh, with Wayne Clough. So at this point, let's, uh, let's walk out. Okay. And Thank you.